today have Dr. John Thompson. That's how I want to introduce him. I generally introduce him as John. My buddy John. I said, hey, Dr. John. That is completely false. <laughs> Do that after a while, John, but you're going to pay a cost. That's the same thing as participating in behavior. 
plays a big role in that. Uh, selfishness, right? pride. My favorite verse in the Bible is in Obadiah 3. There's only one chapter in Obadiah. It's a little bitty book. It's fanta a fantastic book. All the minor prophets are very, very profitable for reading. Um, and Obadiah 3 says that uh, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the cleft of the rock, whose habitation is high, who says in his heart, who can bring me down? Isn't that right? I'm up here, everybody else is down here, and no one else is going to bring me down to their level. Right? That's the quintessential ingredient in pride. Pride is self-deception. You trick yourself into thinking something about yourself that is not an accurate reflection of reality. It's not the truth. It's skewed. It's off. Okay? That's what it means to be prideful. All right? Pride, and I know this is a little bit, I'm getting in the weeds a little bit here. Um, but pride is the original sin. Right? Ezekiel tells us that pride was found in Lucifer, and then he sinned. Okay? All right. That was for free. That was not part of this lesson. All right. <laughs> um, so, why do we participate in these behaviors uh, in relationships? Well, stubbornness, selfishness, pride, all of those things. Um, that we, we participate in these behaviors because they're meeting a need for us. But the problem is, is that the need that, that it's meeting, it's meeting in a very, very unhealthy way. But we continue to do it because it's needing a need nonetheless. N -n 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 nonetheless. Does smoking need a need? Sure. Absolutely. Is it a healthy need? No. Why do people do it? Because it's meeting a need. It's just meeting it in a very unhealthy way. Okay? Similar concept with, with, with regards to how we meet needs in relationships. And we can learn to resolve and manage these issues by developing an internal knowledge of ourselves. Um, sometimes uh, psychology talks about intrapersonal issues and interpersonal issues, and the difference between those two things is that interpersonal issues is between one or more people, and intrapersonal issues are issues that go on within oneself. Okay, so that's the difference. If you hear those terms, those are two separate terms. Somebody didn't. Somebody didn't make a mistake with their, with their grammar, okay? But they refer to two different things, and that's what they're referring to. So we need to, we need to identify these things in ourselves and do some intrapersonal work in order to manage these faulty, unhealthy relationship issues, okay? Um, and how do we do that? Well, there's a famous psychologist by the name of Carl Jung, and uh, he wrote some, like most brilliant people, most brilliant people say and write some really great things that are absolutely profound, that stand the test of time, and they, you know, they'll stand for hundreds of years sometimes, and then they also say some very crazy things, okay? So you have to, you have to read them with a big bucket of salt, okay? But Carl Jung uh, wrote this idea, and I wrote it down for you there, because it is absolutely pivotal in your understanding of intrapersonal work. This is what he wrote. That which you most need to find will be found where you least want to look. Friends, if you have a long-standing problem in your life, if you have some issue that has been bedeviling you for a long time, it's highly probable that you haven't found the answer to it because you haven't gone where you know you need to go but you don't want to. And I don't say that as a charge to all of you, okay? If, I, if I'm going to teach this, I, I might as well be sitting down listening to myself, okay? Like, it's a charge to myself as well. This is true in my own life. Okay, so how do we how, how do we resolve it? How do we manage these issues? How do we adopt the truth? You do it by going where you don't want to go. You do it by doing things you don't necessarily want to do. What is that? Do you read your Bible every day? We'll get into the importance of that here in just a minute. That's one thing that you can start with. And some people say, like, well, John, that's like, man. That's kind of like almost suffering to me. Okay. Okay. I'll take that. But here's the thing. You don't get 
to not suffer in life. But you do get to choose what you suffer for. And there's real hope in that, friends. Okay? So remember that. Don't be afraid to go where you know you don't want to go. Because you'll probably find something of great value there. Right? Um, so, that we examine these dark corners of our lives, let's say. We can, call, we can call those things that. We can call the places where we don't want to go. We can call them these dark corners of our lives. And as you do that, um, you live out this simple but profound idea that Christ mentions in John, in John 8.32. So we'll read John 8.32. Okay, John 8, 32, relatively short verse, it says, We are descendants of Abraham, they replied, um, oh, that's 833, 832, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay? Now, Christ is not, there's a word play going on here in the Greek, okay? He's not talking just about truth in a philosophical sense. He's also, the, the word play, I'll try and deconstruct this for you here. The word play is that he's saying you can't know small t truth without first knowing capital T truth. Okay? That's what he's saying. Right? So there's a little bit of a, of a word play, an exchange going on here. And then, if, if that's true, you'll know the truth, and the truth sets people free. We, we examine these shady corners of our lives in the pursuit of truth. And by doing so, it sets us free. Well, what does it set us free from? It sets us free from a lie. Well, what does that mean? Everybody knows that lying has low-level consequences. Right? Well, people won't trust you if you lie. Right? I go to any elementary school and ask kids what happens if they lie, and they'll tell you that. Right? Well, people won't trust you. People won't want to be around you. People won't want to be a friend, those types of things. Here's at a little bit deeper level what people don't understand about lying is what it does to yourself. Lying produces a phenomenon within a person whereby you cannot trust yourself. Why? Because you're constantly trying to deceive other people, and so you filled your head with deception, and there's going to be a point in time in your life where you're going to have to make a very, very important decision, and you're going to make the wrong choice. Why? Because you're not used to telling the truth. You're not used to pursuing the truth. You're used to tricking other people, and so you have formed neural networks, neural pathways in your brain that are not conducive to your best interest. That, friends, is the terrible consequence of lying. It's what you turn yourself into. That's the utility and the usefulness of pursuing truth. Okay? So this is one of the, one of the ideas that we live out that, that Christ talks about in John 8, 32. You'll we'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what is the truth? The truth is reality. You and I are in this room. That's the truth. Okay, that's a very low resolution truth, but it's no different in, in, a, in a very high resolution yeah, type of a truth. Right? God, we, we sang about it, right? Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty? Well, that's either true or it's not. Right? And if it's true, what does that mean? means that God is the standard of perfection. That's, a, that's one of the things it means. Okay, so the pursuit of truth is very, very um, important. All right? And what does it mean to pursue the truth? What does it mean to tell the truth? Here's one of the things, it means many things, here's one of the things for the sake of our study here this morning, here's one of the things that telling the truth means. It means that you forego pursuing a possible outcome in a conversation. That's what it means. It means that if Kim and I are just talking, we're talking and we're trying to get to the bottom of something, 
And I'm not trying to persuade or to lead Ken in any way, shape, or form. And he's not trying to do the same with me. We're just trying to get to the bottom of something. And we're just letting the chips fall where they may. That's what it means to tell the truth. And Ken might, in the course of the conversation, Ken might think that I am absolutely stone cold crazy. And that's okay. Because we're trying to pursue truth. Maybe I am. And maybe Ken's input in my life. Maybe I need to know that. When the Bible says, uh, as one Christian sharpens another, so as iron sharpens iron, what do you think it's talking about? That. You have to risk offending someone to tell the truth. That's what that means. And that's the, that's the worthwhileness in, in pursuing the truth and telling the truth. You, you give up the possibility of an outcome. You're not focused on that. You're just focused on speaking Speaking the truth. And how do we obtain the truth? Well, we've seen what the truth is. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. That's the consequences of it. But then in John 17, 17, uh, he answers his own question. The truth will set you, the, or the, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what is the truth? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now you know why a few minutes ago I asked you a very simple but profound question. Are you reading your Bible? The Bible isn't just the truth. It's beyond the truth. It's capital T truth. It is layer zero. It is the truth that all other truth is built upon. And if you don't know that, you don't know the rest. That's how that works. Okay? All right. So, now that we've gone through all that, what's the relational significance of all of this? Well, it means that as we pursue these dark, shady corners of our lives, it is the gospel and it is, it is God's word that helps us dispel that darkness. That's how you do that. Okay? That's how that process works. All right, so now that we know that, let's get in to contempt, okay? So, so now, now we have, we've got that piece of the puzzle. Let's look at another piece of the puzzle. Let's look at the second piece. What is contempt? Contempt is severe disapproval mixed with disgust. Whenever you talk to somebody, it's always important. If you don't understand what they're meaning by a word or you constantly find yourself kind of scrambling in a conversation like, I'm not sure what he's talking about. I'm not sure what she's saying. Ask them, what do you mean by that? Because you might be defining a term completely differently than the other person, and you might not even know it. Okay? Highly likely if, if, you, if you're not tracking with another person. So I'm always um, cognizant of that, and I always want to define terms. Okay? So this is how I'm defining contempt. Contempt is severe disapproval mixed with disgust. It conveys the idea, there are your notes, it conveys the idea of a rejection of personhood. It's not that I disagree with what you do or I think that it is wrong. It's that I think you're wrong. That's contempt. And because I think you're wrong, that gives me the right and the justification then to discard you wholesale. Here's the problem. I don't see that in scripture. The woman caught in adultery. The woman at the well. We've got all these examples. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. Got a problem swearing? Well, there's hope for you. Right? We pursue the truth, okay? And the truth keeps us from contempt. All right, so contempt conveys a rejection of personhood. And there's a vivid biblical example of this for the sake of time. Uh, we, we won't um, get into that, but there's a great, great biblical uh, narrative. It starts in 2 Samuel chapter 13, and it goes on for several chapters. Uh, it's the story of David and Absalom and the rape of Tamar. And uh, there's, there's five 
key players. So there's David, there's Absalom, there's Tamar, there's Amnon, and there's Jonadab. Okay, those are the five main characters in this narrative. And um, uh, Absalom and Tamar are full brother and sister, same dad, same mom, and then um, uh, Amnon is, uh, David is Amnon's father, but Amnon has a different mother, so it's a blended family situation, okay? And Amnon, long story short, um, falls in love with his sister and rapes her, and there is absolute chaos that ensues because David really didn't do anything about it. Uh, in, in the text, if you, if, you read the, if you read the story in the text, it says that when David found out about it, David was very angry. Well, it's not only what's, what's, what's important, it isn't only what's said, it's what's not said. Did he do anything? No. What happened? Contempt was spawned and grew in Absalom. Because his father did nothing because one of his half-brothers raped his sister. And how bad did it get? Well, Absalom um, tried to overthrow David and tried to have him kill him. What are the what, what are the what are some of the, the terrible consequences of allowing contempt to grow in your life? Well, it could spawn life or death situations, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, you can read about it. If you know somebody who makes movies, like tell them the story. Like they need to make a movie out of this. Like this is this is serious movie material right here because it's it's crazy. It's a crazy story. Okay, and I encourage you all to read it on your own. It's really really something. And just keep this idea of contempt in the back of your mind as you read that because that's exactly what is happening through the entire story. How did this whole thing get so out of whack? Absalom ends up murdering his brother, then he tries to overthrow his father, and he ends up sleeping with all his father's wives and concubines. It's a mess. It is a mess. All because of content. For the men in the room. <coughs> men, the takeaway from that story is this. Handling the business. Men receive love by feeling respected. If you feel respected, don't let that stuff go wrong. Well, I don't want to fight. You're already in a fight. Wake up. Okay? You're going to be in a worse one if you don't handle those types of things. Okay? Contempt is one step up from criticism. Contempt is the worst of all the horsemen. That's what we've been talking about. I mentioned John Gottman uh, last time I was here. That's who I'm getting this material from. Uh, contempt is the worst of all the horsemen because it conveys open disgust and disrespect for your partner. Very, very difficult to have a, a, an in-depth relationship with someone when you're constantly getting the verbal and nonverbal message that the other person's very presence disgusts you. It's corrosive in nature. That's what contempt is. It's like rust. It utterly destroys anything it touches. And the related way, it could be a work relationship, it could be a marriage, it could be a relationship with your, with your kiddos, whatever it is. Contempt, that's what contempt does. It destroys everything it touches. And it might take two months, it might take two years, it might take 20 years, depending on how tough and stubborn you are. <laughs> but it will, it will destroy it. That's what contempt does. Okay? Contempt involves tearing down or being insulting towards your partner. I remember uh, Naomi and I, anybody that um, follows me on Facebook knows I'm a big foodie. And uh, uh, Naomi and I go out to eat all the time. I love when I tell these crazy places and eating all this different food. And uh, I remember many years ago, we went out with a, uh, a friend, uh, and we went to their house to pick them up. And I, I've become really good. This August will be 20 years uh, in the mental health field for me, okay? And during those 20 years, I've become really good at kind of switching my counsel brain off when I walk out the door, okay? And uh, we go to this couple's house, and we, we you know, knock on the door, and, uh, you know, he answers, the husband comes and he answers, hey, come on in, and, you know, we're like, we're standing, we kind of come on in, we're standing there in the entryway, and uh, uh, he hollers back uh, to the direction of the master bedroom, and says, uh, hey, uh, John and Naomi are here, are, are, are you ready? And 
callers back and says, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing just a couple more minutes. I'll be right there. And here's what the husband says. Well, take your time. You do anyway. And like I said, usually I'm really good at turning off that counsel. <laughs> Then the natural outcome of that is that the relationship 
will be solid. It will be a good relationship. And you'll be able to participate in some of the things that we're talking about and avoid some of the things that we're talking about. Okay? So, fondness and admiration are the antidote to contempt. You need to be open and honest um, with your spouse or with coworkers. Uh, and many people are really unaware of the crucial role that fond fondness and admiration play in their day-to-day -day lives. They just don't, they don't realize the depth of the gravity of something. A lot of times people think that because situations or problems are complex, that we need an equally complex answer to answer that problem. No, we don't. Right? If you're if, if you're a counselor and I come and see you, let's let's make it severe. Okay, I come and see you, and I'm court ordered to come and see you um, because uh, Naomi uh, called the police on me because I am abusive, physically abusive. Right? I beat her up. I put her in the hospital, and I come to see you as a therapist. We can sort through. You guys can sort through all the reasons of how John became the way he was and why John is the way he is and John was raised in an abusive home and that's important to do. Don't get me wrong. You need to sort through all of those little details. But at the end of the day, don't you think that John just needs to stop beating his wife? Right? This is what I'm talking about. Problems oftentimes are very dynamic. They're, they're multifaceted, they're very complex, but the solutions to those same problems is oftentimes very, very straightforward. Okay? Contempt is the same way. I will have people come in and they will talk to me for months about how awful their spouse is. Once a week they'll come in and just unload, they'll back the truck up. Beep, beep, beep. Right? In the counseling office. And I'll ask them, what did you see out of them in the first place? Why did you get married? <laughs> I don't know. They don't even want to think about it. That's how engrossed they are in contempt, in hatred for the person that they're married to. Don't let yourself get that. That will be of absolutely no value to you whatsoever. Okay? So, how do we foster fondness and admiration for our spouse? Well, you maintain a sense of respect for them. And you remind yourself of your spouse's positive attributes. Or you remind yourself of your co-workers' positive attributes. That's what you do. Okay? Um, and you do that even as you wrestle with their flaws. Isn't it fascinating that in marriage especially, we start to date someone because they're different from us. But then after a while, we're agitated because they're different from us. <laughs> no, it's that they, they add value to our lives, and we need to understand that. We need to understand that God loves variety. And that part of that, that love of variety is a variety in personality. And so we need to learn to value that as well. Handle problems lovingly. Right? Now, one note about handling problems, um, there's really kind of, from my Experience. There's really kind of two different types of people. There's there's um, the problem solver type, and then there's the wait and see type. Okay, I'm a problem solver. My wife is a wait and see type. Okay, and here's how contempt can be built when problems arise in a relationship. I wrote it down for you there. Okay, when problem solvers jump in to solve a problem prematurely, that's key there, prematurely. It can create contempt in the wait and see type. Why? Because they feel like they're pushing. Well, that was almost bad. Almost took that away. Okay. <laughs> they, because they, they feel like they're pushing. Almost pushed the electric away. Okay. They, they, feel like, they feel like you're pushing them. Okay? That's what the wait and see type does. They feel like 
you're, you're jumping the gun. But when the wait and see type waits too long to solve a problem, it can create contempt in the problem solver type. Okay? So you say, well, John, what's the answer to that? Well, you need to talk it out. And both parties need to be, and I, I tell people this kind of joke, you have to joke me, both parties kind of need to be a little bit frustrated with the situation, and then you know you've reached a happy medium. Okay? Because if the problem solver is like, oh my word, this is never going to get solved. And if the wait and see type is like, oh my word, this is just going way too fast. That's probably about the right time to solve. Okay? Right about there. You, you've, you've hit that, that sweet spot in the middle. Okay? Okay, conclusion. Let's wrap all this up. I just wanted to give you guys four bullet points, um, lastly there, on just some ideas to, to, to prevent you from engaging in this contemptuous type of uh, lifestyle and relationship dynamic. Uh, number one there. The highest form of love is focused attention. Look at people. Listen to them. Spend time with them. That is how you show people that you really do care about them and that you really do love them. Okay? Secondly, you're never persuasive when you're abrasive. The way you say something will determine how it's received. Okay? So, food for, food for thought. Love is tactful as well as truthful. This is, this, this is one of the supreme Christian ethics, to speak the truth in love. If you speak only truth to the other person, the tendency is that or the pattern, rather, is that the other person is going to receive it as brutality. Okay? Well, you can go talk to John, but buckle up, buttercup. Okay? Well, who likes to be talked to that way? Nobody likes to be talked to that way. Right? Uh, conversely, if you speak only love, it will usually be received by the listener as a lie. Well, you can go talk to John, but he's going to tell you here. Okay? So remember that. That's a, that I, I know, I think that I've said that before here, but it, this, it, it bears repeating because it's such an important, uh, an important relationship uh, uh, trait. Okay? Lastly, love is understanding, not demanding. One of the greatest tests of your character, friends, is how you treat people serve you. I've been to our food daily and I said we're foodies, we go out to eat a lot. And every once in a while, not very often, but every once in a while I will see another table and how they treat the server. Ooh, boy, my Irish woman starts, starts boiling. I do not treat people that way. There's just no reason for that. Okay? Life is tough enough and life is filled with enough suffering we do not have to bring more into it willingly. Okay? All right, guys. Well, um, that's it. So, thank you, guys. Do I need to pray with the Okay. Father, um, I thank you for, Father, I thank you for everyone here this morning, Lord. I ask that you would richly bless them. I ask that you would work in their lives. I ask that you would uh, bring things to their mind that they know that they need work on that they've been hiding from and that they can that they can hide from them no longer, that they can that they can realize that 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 hiding from these things only gives them power in their lives. Father, I pray that you would do the same work in my own. And Father, I pray that you would bless us and give us opportunities to witness in the coming week. In your son's precious name I pray these things, Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, is that right?